Hello and welcome to the viewers of this video. This is the orange fan here bringing you another entry for the episode recap and thoughts category. This video will be dedicated to the B segment of episode 34 of Codename Kids Next Door, Operation Lockdown. We begin this segment at the Sector V treehouse in the middle of the night. Suddenly, an alarm goes off, and Number One contacts the rest of the Sector V operatives, indicating that he's on his way back to the treehouse, but he also wants them to activate a Code L62. He stresses that this is not a drill. So Number Two, Number Four, and Number Five wake up, and they proceed to head to different locations of the treehouse with regards to this code L62. Number two and number five head to the central chamber of the treehouse where they uh, head to the computer in the chamber to activate the code L62, which is revealed to be a lockdown. So throughout the rest of the night, the treehouse will be locked up. So no one can get in or out of the treehouse until sunrise when the lockdown ends. To activate the lockdown, number two and number five have to input the code within the computer. They also have to pass verification procedures. The first is for them to state their code names slash designated numbers, as well as their positions within the Sector V team. So number five's position is the second in command of Sector V, while number two's position is the 2x4 technology officer of Sector V. The next verification procedure is for them to place genetic identification within uh, a certain spot of the computer, and the genetic identification that they use are their respective boogers. After the, yes, after the verification procedures have been uh, followed, the uh, lockdown officially begins, or it's starting to begin, I should say. So we see the doors, windows, and even the toilets of the treehouse are being locked up. And there's now a red light uh, throughout the entirety of the treehouse interior. And number two and number five rush off to, to where number four is right now. Number five also has a tracking device with her. I believe they call it the Trekamabob. And this particular tracking device has a map of the Sector V treehouse. Its purpose is to detect for any potential intruders within the treehouse. But according to the tracking device, there are no intruders within the treehouse. Number four is currently in number two's room. More specifically, he's by the hanger within number two's room, waiting for number one to return. And number two and number five join number four soon enough. Eventually, the trio do see number one in the Roadstar vehicle. However, the Roadstar looks like it's in uh, bad condition. It looks like it could crash at any moment. And although it is a close call, number one does manage Yes, number one manages to enter the treehouse before the doors of the Hainer fully close. So the Sector V operatives are all accounted for within the treehouse before um, the lockdown officially starts. Number two, number four, and number five bring the unconscious number one to the med lab, but they notice that he has no injuries. They figured that number one must have been very lucky. Suddenly, the tracking device that number five has says that there is an intruder within the treehouse. None of them can understand why, because the tracking device didn't indicate any intruders not too long ago. So, or yeah, number five thinks that it might just be a malfunction, but she decides to err on the side of caution and investigate anyway. She also instructs number two to stay by number one's side, and she instructs number four to wake up number three because she says it's against the rules for any kids next door operatives to sleep during a lockdown. So number five sets off to investigate the treehouse with the tracking device and a splanker um, as her weapon to defend against any potential intruders. 
Meanwhile, in number three's room, we see number three wake up after, or yes, number three wakes up af in the middle of a dream, yes. Number three wakes up in the middle of a dream, and she notices that her big bottom rainbow monkey, the stuffed animal that she brought to bed with her before she fell asleep, is no longer in her bed. So she tries to find her big bottom rainbow monkey, and she does find it uh, on the floor within her room, not too far off from where her bed is. She picks up her stuffed animal, but she notices something is wrong. Suddenly, a gloved hand reaches from the ceiling and grabs number three, bringing her up to the ceiling. Back in one of the hallways, number five is, is still investigating, but she has she's found no indication of an intruder. She's starting to think uh, with more certainty that the tracking device is malfunctioning, but suddenly she hears number three screaming, so she rushes off to see what's wrong. Number four makes it to number three's room before number five does, and number four tries to figure out what's wrong. Number three explains that her bottom hurts right now. Number five arrives soon enough, and she notices that the big bottom rainbow monkey uh, has some of its stuffing coming out from uh, being hit a lot. Number five uh, figures out, or yes, number five thinks that this is the work of Count Spankulot. This, because spanking is uh, Count Spankulot's main, uh, main uh, method of um, attacking others. Number four, though, is confused because Count Spankulot is supposed to be in prison after the events of season two. Number five figures that Count Spankulot must have escaped. But she also thinks that maybe number one might know exactly how Count Spankulot escaped. So they all head off to number one's, uh, um, yeah, they go, they go to number one in the med lab to see if their leader has woken up just yet. And on their way there, number four is showing a lot of paranoia, worried about how he could be hit with Count Spankulot's uh, stinging wrath soon. But eventually, as they reach the med lab, they see number two out in the hallway, and he's been spanked by Count Spankulot as well. Number five inquires what happened, and number two admits that he uh, left his post to get a snack, but on his way back, he could hear the laughing of Count Spankulot, and then he felt the steamy wrath. Or yeah, that's how they usually describe Count Spankulot's attacks as his steamy wrath. And so, yes, that's how number two was ambushed by Count Spankulot. Number five notices that number, yeah, number five notices that number one is still unconscious, but he seems to be fine. There, otherwise, there, there doesn't seem to be any other um, things that are amiss right now. And number four, though, is becoming even more paranoid. He's worried about how he'll be the next one to be spanked by Count Spankulot. And uh, during his rant, number four, who also has a splanker, accidentally hits number two, who's um, still feeling sore. And then number two accidentally hits number three when number two sits on a bench and the bench uh, reaches up and hits number three, who's still feeling sore. So number two, number three, and number four are all making a lot of noise and number five snaps at them to shut up. And she finally decides that she is going to go find Count Spankula, but she stresses that the others must stay with number one at all times. And under no conditions, yeah, under no circumstances are they to leave number one's side while number five tries to find Count Spankula. After number five leaves, number four is still panicking and he wants to find some way out of here, but number two reiterates that the lockdown is in effect until sunrise. Number four questions, uh, or yeah, number four questions if there weren't any uh, emergency uh, or contingency plans uh, set in place. And number two eventually admits that there actually is a code that can overwrite any uh, kids next door computer codes, the quadruple emergency bypass code. Number four urges number two to use the emergent, yeah, Number four urges number two to use the quadruple emergency bypass code, but number two admits that number five is the one who has the code, and even then, she's not allowed to use it either. 
uh, number four questions why, and number two just admits that the rules say that the quadruple emergency bypass code is so important that no one can use the code and and not under any circumstances. Or yes, the code can't be used under any circumstances by anyone. And number four points out how ridiculous that is. And number four says he's going to go find number five and convince her to make an exception to this rule. But suddenly, number one wakes up and he assures number four that he will talk to number five. Meanwhile, number five enters the central chamber of the treehouse but she still can't find uh, uh, Count Spankula. She also notices that the tracking device says that there's three intruders now. She tosses the tracking device to the ground, figuring that it's malfunctioning, and she admits that she's in a real pickle right now. She doesn't know what to do if she can't find Count Spankula, with number one still unconscious and the rest of the team not being able to help in any real way. Number five begins to consider using the quadruple emergency bypass code, but she decides against it because of how the rules say no one can use it under any circumstances. But when she hears number four being spanked, she decides to um, break this rule, even though she admits to herself that number one would not be happy about this. Just as she's about to activate the code, though, number one suddenly appears within the central chamber, and he comments about how number five dropped the tracking device. Number five is glad to see number one is awake, but she tells number one that the tracking device is malfunctioning. Number one, however, disagrees. He points out to her that it's working properly. Number five, however, thinks this isn't the case still because she says that the tracking device says that there's an intruder in the central chamber, but they're the only two that's present. Number one says that means one of them is the intruder. And number one jumps into the air and he suddenly transforms into a vampire. And he starts to talk with that Count Dracula voice that you hear in TV shows and movies. I'm sure you know the one I'm talking about. But yes, number one is now a vampire. Number five realizes that Count Spankulot is behind this, but in an indirect way. And soon enough, though... Number two, number three, and number four quickly rush to the central chamber as well to figure out what's going on, but they start to act suspicious when number one comments about how number five was breaking the rules. Number one comments about how number five was about to do... Yes, number five was about to activate the quadruple emergency bypass code, which is against the rules, and number one says that the that number five will be transformed like the others. Number five soon sees that number two, number three, and number four all transform, or yes, those three transformed into vampires as well. Even the big bottom rainbow monkey has turned into a vampire monkey, and they all talk with those Count Dracula voices too. And yes, um, so yes, they're all four of the um, vampire sector V operatives try to uh, try to turn number five into one of them as well. Number five, though, is able to stall when she tries to. Um, yeah, number five tries to urge number one to fight uh, Count Spankulot's influence, saying that number one is not one to harm uh, another kid. And this seems to stop number two, number three, and number four as well. Number one is struggling. It looks like he is trying to fight the influence of Count Spankulot's uh, effects on him, or this curse that Count Spankulot has placed on him. But unfortunately, it seems the vampire side wins out, and number one is preparing to uh, is preparing to attack number five. But number five says that he won't be able to attack her tonight. This baffles number one, and he inquires why this is so. And number five says that tonight is over. So yes, um, the lockdown ends and the and we see that the sun is rising and the sunlight harms the vampire sector V operatives. But suddenly we cut to a different scene. We're now at uh, a prison and it's nighttime. In the prison, we see Count Spankulot is talking to five inmates. We don't get a good look at their faces because their hats are kind of obscuring their faces. So 
We don't get a good look at these inmates, but Count Spankula is telling these inmates about how he used hypnosis to lure number one to the prison so he could spank number one. However, Count Spankulat spanked number one while not wearing his gloves. So in Count Spankulat's case, when he spanks someone without his gloves, that turns someone into a spank-happy vampire like him. And Count Spankulat admits that the only way to cure this curse is for number one uh, to spank him, Count Spankulat. But Count Spankulat says that can't happen because he's in prison while number one is... Uh, is back at his treehouse right now. And Count Spankulat apparently was telling these inmates about it because he was hoping that would make him cool enough to join their club. But the inmates say that they have a rule about not including vampires in their club. Angered, Count Spankulat tells them to ignore this rule as he threatens to spank them, and they begrudgingly agree to uh, break this rule. Count Spankulat starts to sing, sing and do a dance about how he's uh, in the club with them, but one of the inmates points out that Count Spankulat broke the rules, and then the inmate uh, reveals uh, their face. This inmate is actually number five. Naturally, the four other inmates are really the Sector V operatives, the other Sector V operatives, the ones who have been turned into vampires. And yes, the segment ends with the four vampire Sector V operatives spanking Count Spankulat to undo the curse. So yes, this segment is a sequel to the Season 2 segment, Operation Spank, because Count Spankulat ended up in prison after the events of that segment. And I did mention it before, that's what makes uh, uh, some continuity hiccups stand up the way how Count Spankulat had cameos in Operation Movie and Operation uh, Afloat, even though he was supposed to be in prison at this time, as this segment indicated. But again, I didn't really, um, they didn't really take too much away from it for me. It's just more like, oh, I just noticed those continuity hiccups sort of thing. But yes, Count Spankulat was the main villain of this segment, even though he didn't directly um, cause any Harm. He was more like the instigator of the conflict because the, yeah, four of the Sector V operatives who were turned into vampires, they were the heavies or, yeah, the villains who were carrying the plot or, or doing the most uh, actions during this um, uh, segment. They were the ones who were doing the legwork while Count Spankulat uh, merely instigated the uh, plot of this particular segment. So you could say... Yeah, this would, yeah, I would definitely say this was a number five spotlight appearance because she was the only Sector V operative who wasn't turned into a vampire. And I guess I might as well just bring it up now, but the kids next door or the Sector V operatives being turned into vampires actually does happen in the video game, Operation Video Game. <laughs> Although in Operation Video Game, number five actually does get turned into a vampire. So... For anyone who's curious about Number Five's uh, vampire form, Operation Video Game actually reveals Number Five's vampire form. In the video game, Number Four is actually the Sector V operative who isn't turned into a vampire. So that's a by the way detail for anyone who's curious. Now, otherwise, the other big thing about this segment is the Code L62, the lockdown, where where the treehouse. Um, is in lockdown mode until sunrise, and there's no way to uh, bypass this. Well, there is a way, but um, but it's not allowed. The quadruple emergency bypass code, a code that can override any um, any kids next door computer codes. But um, as number two explained, no one is allowed to use it. No kids next door operative is allowed to use it, and they can't use it under any circumstances whatsoever. And what's funny is, while season three was the yeah season three was the season where most fans would say, yeah most fans would say season three is the season where number four was exaggerated into the dumb muscle of season four. But yeah, number four actually brings up a very valid point in this segment. He brings up yeah his point is. What's what good is the quadruple emergency bypass code if you're not allowed to use it under any circumstances? And he brings up 
yeah, that's a very good point. It's ridiculous that the code exists, but no one is allowed to use it under any circumstances. Uh, it could be con it could be seen as an equivalent to um, to um, that uh, these yeah there's like a phenomenon in some video games where there's this really great item to have but most players end up not using the item uh, during the course of the game because it's so great that they risk uh, wasting it so. Yeah, um, in TV Tropes term, that's called too awesome to use. That's essentially what the quadruple emergency bypass code is. And yeah, I have to agree with number four. It's pretty ridiculous that the code exists, but they're not allowed to use it under any circumstances. It might as well not exist if they can't use it under any circumstances. And I believe this is the only segment where the... Um, where the quadruple emergency bypass code is ever brought up, or the only entry. I don't recall the quadruple emergency bypass code ever being brought up again after this entry. Oh, another interesting detail about this segment, and uh, it also uh, carries on from Operation Spank as well, but Count Spankulot being in prison actually counts as an example of early installment weirdness. Yes, we're uh, in the we're in season three, but there still is an example of early installment weirdness. What I mean by that is, I believe as early as season four. Yes, I think it's as early as season four. But eventually, yes, I think as early as season four, we see that um, the rogues gallery of the kids next door are actually placed in a specialized prison, a specialized kids next door prison. I should clarify. So Count Spankulot being in re regular prison is a case of early installment weirdness because the later half of the series shows um, a specialized prison that the kids next door have made to contain their the members of their rogues gallery. So yeah, it won't be until, yeah, season four is when we actually get to see this specialized prison. So we'll go into greater detail about that later on, but... For the sake of those, and yeah, I don't want to give it away just yet for those who are just following along with the recap and thoughts videos, but I will give you a clue. We actually have seen the uh, area, or yes, we've seen the Kids Next Door base that this specialized prison is located in. That's my clue for anyone who isn't aware of the answer. So that's your clue for those who want to speculate before we eventually cover the entries that deal with this specialized Kids Next Door prison. So otherwise, I think that's about it for this particular uh, segment. So Count Spankulot got to be the focus villain, although he was more the instigator rather than the one causing direct action. And we did get to learn a little bit more about how Count Spankulot's powers um, function. And, um, yeah, this segment, like I said, was a sequel to a segment from season two. So it's an example of the show's serialized nature without being one of the uh, major storylines within the series. This was more like a minor storyline in the grand scheme of things. But it's a cool example of how uh, Codename Kids Next Door became more and more serialized over the course of the series. And, like I said, it's one of the latest examples of early installment weirdness compared to the later half of the series. But otherwise, there we go for now. So as of this video, we've now discussed the B segment of episode 34 of Codename Kids Next Door on this channel. Take care and until next time.